Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Short Hops with manager Kevin Hooper. Short Hops is a weekly program that gives you, the fans, the opportunity to ask the Wichita Wingnut Skipper questions about baseball or life in general and to hear his great insights. My apologies for not having the show on a little earlier, but a family emergency had me a little behind schedule, so I apologize for that. Let's get right to Short Hops. We want to welcome back Kevin for us this week. Kevin, can we just get a, a little discussion with you about acquisitions that you've made since the last time that we talked, um, specifically around Harrison Kane and some of the other things that you've had going on? Yeah, Harrison Kane's been a guy that we've had our eyes on for a couple of years. I, I really like the way that he plays the game and goes about his business. He, he's one of those guys that will literally run through a wall for his team, plays the game the right way, plays hard night in and night out, who can really run and can really defend. Um, you know, he hit 330 in 2013 when he was in Laredo, and we're hoping to get a little bit of that offensive production back to him. Uh, I know he came, we, when we got him, he, he came in hitting 230, but he's had a couple good games with us. So key addition for us, we feel, with the speed that he brings to the bottom of the lineup also. And then getting a guy, Starlin Rodriguez, he's been a great addition for us so far, um, really can swing the bat. So offensively, he's going to help tremendously. Harrison Kane is another guy who can play a lot of positions for you. So you're seeing him. Yes, kind yes. Of and he can really, he can really, really run also. So we added quite a bit of speed in those two guys this week. John Link rejoins the team. Uh, tell us a little about yes. how that came to be. Yeah, well, he ended up getting uh, getting released from AAA, and you know, my phone rang about 10 minutes after he got released. So I know a lot of people would have loved to have, a, have the opportunity to get him, but he loves Wichita, and this is where he wanted to be. So we were we were glad to bring him back with open arms, and he's had two stellar starts for us so far. He'll be a, he'll be a huge addition for us down this uh, second half of the season. Now, would he have been a guy who was a, an unrestricted free agent wise, or did you still own the rights to him at that point? Yes, we still had the rights to him. Um, you know, I believe if he would if he would have finished out this season with the Marlins, then he would have become a he would become a free agent. Excellent. Uh, John Nestor looks good. Looks completely healthy now for you. Yes. Yeah. Doing well. Uh, he's a He's a tremendous catcher. Uh, I think we looked up yesterday, and he's thrown out 15 of 28 base runners this year. Oh, wow. So, you know, and, and only have the 28 attempts. Not so many guys are even really trying to run on him. And we tell our pitching staff, just give him a chance. You know, be quick enough to the plate where you give him a chance because more often than not, he's going to throw the guy out. Now, I want to ask you with the reacquisition of Ben Como and with John Link coming back, does this mean that uh, Scott Kuzminski will move to the bullpen permanently? Yes, we've already moved him to the bullpen, yes. Yeah, so he'll become our long guy down on the 10. He actually finished out the game for us last night and looked great. Two strikeouts, went one, two, three in the order there in the ninth, finished it out for us. And You know, it's nice to have that luxury to have him down there because if something was to happen with the starter, then we could just continue to jump back in that rotation and fill that role. But for the time being, with with the guys we have in the rotation, how strong it is, he'll be one of our uh, long guys down in the bullpen. I thought what is a nice run you've had in the last two nights is that your bullpen has had six innings of work, and every inning you got two strikeouts out of out of a guy. So nice stretch there. Yeah, pretty impressive. They've looked really good, and that's been a knock uh, for us throughout the season is finishing out games, and we've made a – a strong point in suit of that and speaking with them that we need to, when I, when I hand you the ball, you need to get after it and, and get guys out, get us right back in to hit. So it's been a fun couple nights for sure with the bullpen and how they produce for us. Well, we'll get to our questions for this week. Clarence from Emporia wanted to know with having Kansas City this week and how hot they came in during the weekend, do you believe in momentum and how do you think that aids a team? Yeah, I do believe in momentum. I know some people do, some people don't, but, uh, you know, I, I believe another word you can use is confidence. If you don't want to use momentum, you know, they came in with a lot of confidence. They were nine and one in their last ten coming in. You know, I felt like we had that that first game in in check too, where it was tied and it was five to five, and we couldn't add on there for a while. And then Bennett ended up giving up the home run to Bailey in the seventh, and we couldn't manufacture anything from the seventh on. So we were right in that first one. Then obviously in the second, win the second one two to one, and yesterday got a got a little more offense and great pitching again and end up winning 10 to three, but uh, one more big one tonight with them. And then we got the one game single game with 
the team we're chasing tomorrow in Joplin. Longtime Win- Wingnuts fan would like to know, he says, it seems that you're making a lot of moves to bring in guys that other teams don't want, and then they take off for you. Why are you able to get more out of them? Oh, that's a good question. I've, I've had a lot of people say that and ask that, you know, that uh, it seems when we get guys that uh, we seem to get the most out of them for whatever reason. I don't know if it's like we've spoken about many times before. We we love to work, um, you know, and we try to bring out any the best of our guys' abilities when whenever we have the opportunity to do so. So, um you know, it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's it's always fun bringing in new faces and seeing what they're capable of doing, and and trying to get the most out of them because that's my job as a manager and, and my coaching staff is to get the most we can get out of every single guy that puts this uniform on. And I feel like we've had a lot of success doing that just because of the hard work we put in and the teaching that we do. Would you feel that maybe sometimes, and I'm going to look at Matt Padgett as an example, is that. Uh, he struggled for you at first, but you stuck with him. And mm-hmm. he he then just all of a sudden has caught fire lately and, and is hitting really well. Is it is it maybe that other clubs can't don't feel like they can afford to give a guy a chance to work himself out of a slump, possibly? Yeah, possibly. I mean, teach their own. You know, as I always say, it, uh, for each and every manager, they get to make their own decisions and, and decide how they want and just make decisions on what they think is going to be best for their for their team. So, you know, he's and he's got to produce. He's a high mon- money guy for us and a veteran guy that that uh, we know what he's capable of doing. And now we just got to get that out of him every single day, and we continue to to talk about that. And here lately, we've gotten it out of him, and hopefully, we can continue to do so because he can be a big part of the middle of that lineup. Sam from Wichita would like to know if you ever take the green light off of a runner. Yeah. Yeah, not very often. Um, but, no, there's times where we don't run, you know, certain situations. I, I think the game dictates that. The game dictates if the score, the chase and runs, if we're up, how many we're up, stuff like that. So, yeah, no, there's uh, there's times where we definitely shut guys down. But more often than not, we do have the green light in certain situations. But uh, there will be times where – we have to uh, put the stop sign on and shut guys down. Guy who was confused asked, and I second his question mm-hmm. here, um, I guess I don't really understand how a player makes it through a system. It looked like John Link was pitching well, but he gets cut by the Marlins. What's the criteria for keeping players? Yeah, that, uh, that's another baffling one, I guess. Um, you know, it happens a lot at this level where you see guys. And then he comes in the first night with us and throws five innings gives up one hit and is 94 to 96 on the radar gun all night long. Um, so you tell me how a team can't use that in AAA, I guess. But, uh, you know, I, as I always say with affiliated ball, it's always a need thing. You know, I think the Marlins had quite a few power power arms, and he was thrown out of the bullpen, and you know, it's just one of those timing situations, I guess, where maybe they needed to bring a guy up from AA or a guy to come back down from the big leagues. That's the nature of the beast and the tough part of the business that uh, that we're involved in. There's a lot of situations where you shake your head and wonder, wow, how can a, a team in affiliate ball not use a guy like this? But there's a handful of those guys, um, not only on our team, but in this league as well. Hal would like to know, what are some good ways that you that a catcher can get in sync with his pitching staff? I think the biggest thing, like a lot of things in life, is communication. Um you know, just having a game plan, come up with a game plan and communicate. Trying to get on that same page, that's a big key is the pitching, the pitcher and the catcher just uh, being on the same page, and we strive to get that every night. And I think the biggest thing is communication, you know, and experience of working with a guy. You know, I think the more the catcher works with the pitcher, obviously the better, you know, in sync they're going to be because they're more comfortable with each other. So it's just a comfort thing. It's a, a communication thing. And like I said, trying to get in sync the best we can. Mark would like to know how long after winning the championship was it before you had to start focusing on the 2015 season? For me, probably the next day. <laughs> uh, it, uh, it's always a work in progress for me. You know, I'm always, I'm always thinking of, of things, you know, to help this team any any way that I can, and 
No, I mean, we, I always try to take some time off of it uh, when the season ends. And last year, obviously, went into the championship. It was pretty busy there for a while with championship stuff and dealing with all that here around town. But, uh, you know, I usually take – I usually kind of try to take like a month to get away from it. Um, there's times you just got to get away from it. and uh, But my mind's always thinking about it. You know, I may not be on the phone actually working on it, but I'm always thinking about it and thinking ahead of, of the ways that uh, we can improve this team for the for the upcoming year after season ends. Now, do you and Josh uh, Robertson kind of work something out so that each of you can have some time away and the other guy is kind of, you know, handling transactions or something if that becomes necessary? No, we're, uh, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm always the guy that is mainly doing that stuff. He's just the final say on everything. Um, you know, and then there's some guys that we work on together. Maybe his connections with the Royals. You know, there's a lot of those management guys up there in the front office of the big leagues. So it's like a Royals guy. He'll he'll take that one kind of under his wing and start the process, and then I'll come in and finish it. But, uh, no, we're always just working together. Um, it's just kind of both of us. You know, I think we both always see the transactions every day from the league and always just keeping our ears out and open for any, any new players that can help our team for the upcoming season. Phil would like to know if you've got to see Scott Richmond pitch for in the Pan Am games. Um, I don't think Richie has pitched yet. Um, I know that they lost to the Dominican yesterday, maybe, or the day before. Um, but, no, I have not gotten to see anything or have even heard a whole lot about it yet. So um, I was actually going to take some time today and try to look up the schedule and see what's going on with it. But, uh, no, as far as I know, he has not even pitched yet. Uh, our next question comes. We have Sal from Wichita, who saw that Anthony Capra and Matt yeah. Navaris went to play in Mexico and also saw that this was listed as AAA and would like to know w- what really the level of competition is because he doesn't see guys that jump generally from the Mexican leagues to the major leagues. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it's listed as AAA just because of their affiliation with Major League Baseball. Um they're affiliated with MLB and minor league baseball, and um, it's just kind of a branch of it, I believe. And, yeah, there's a lot of former big leaguers in that league. I don't know if – I mean, I've never been a part of it, so I don't think I could answer the question of a AAA level, you know, th- throughout. But uh, I know there's some really good players down there. I know Brent Cleveland's down there doing really well for himself. Capra and Navarro are arguably two guys that could pitch in AAA. So I think you don't see guys go from the Mexican League to the big leagues just because of the transactions and maybe being difficult to deal with some of the teams down in Mexico. At least that's what I've heard from experience is that, uh, you know, it's just like anybody playing for us. They want to know, is going to Mexico going to help them financially? Yeah, it is going to help you. You can make more money in Mexico than you do here in Indy Ball. But, if you want to play in the big leagues and get back to affiliated ball, your quickest route is going to be from indie ball, not from the Mexican league more often than not. You very rarely see minor league slash major league teams sign guys from the Mexican league. It might happen every once in a while, but it's not very often. More often than not, it would be from a from an indie ball level. That's very interesting. I was not aware of that. I should say that uh, Sal wanted to identify himself as a big fan of yours, so I did want to have oh, that back thank in. Thank you, Sal. Appreciate it. Appreciate the question and appreciate the support. Sheila from Wichita uh, says that she was watching clips of managers who were having meltdowns, and she wanted to know if you've ever had a meltdown and what that looked like if you did. Uh, no, I'm not a guy who's going to have very many meltdowns. Um, I keep my composure pretty much all the time. Obviously, I've been thrown out of some games, but it's never gotten to the point where it's a meltdown. I've never thrown a tantrum or thrown anything or anything like that. So I'm pretty much getting my two cents in and uh, getting in what I need to get in and then turn around and walk into the clubhouse. So no real big shenanigans or meltdowns for me. You probably won't see that um, from me in the future. I apologize for anybody who's wanting to see that out of me. <laughs> but uh, more often than not, like I said, I, uh, I try to handle myself as professional as I can don't get too out of control with it. Do you see that that works well for sub-managers, or, or do you think that that's something that kind of players look at and go, 
wow, this guy needs to settle down. I think, if anything, it's just bringing a laugh out of people, you know. Um, I've never seen a big meltdown like guys throwing coolers, bats, or whatever, like pumping a ball club up. Now, I do believe there's going to be times where you're, you're fighting for your guys and you're getting thrown out of a game, you know, that, that's going to show your, your team some something. But, uh, no, in my experiences, the huge meltdowns, like I said, I think it's just more of a laugh, more of a sports center top ten moment than, than anything else. Interesting. Ted would like to know if you have a favorite all-star moment as a player. Well, I was fortunate I got to play in, you know, a couple all-star games. Uh, in the Midwest League, I, Albert Pujols was a teammate of mine. I remember him winning the home run derby that year, and, and that was a, a fun thing to watch. And just we actually hosted it in Kane County that year. That was pretty memorable, just playing at home, um, an all-star game at home in front of your home crowd. And then I have to say, the year I played, in the, the American Association in 2008 when St. Paul hosted it. Um, you know, I'm not sure if everybody knows Bill Murray's relationship with the St. Paul Saints and and whatnot, but, uh, you know, Bill actually made a mound visit that year, and I was playing short, obviously, and we all huddled up on the mound, and he handed each of us a piece of gum, and I've actually got a, a picture of it that uh, I'll cherish forever that uh, – Pretty neat, pretty neat experience. So that's obviously a, a big memory of mine and an all-star game as well. Interesting. Ted would also like to know if there's a favorite all-star moment in watching the, the big league game that uh, you have. Well, unfortunately, a lot of times we're playing. So, you know, th these days I don't get to see the game. I just get to see the highlights. But I, I'd say the biggest moment for me of a MLB all-star game was in 97 when I actually went to the game with my my current wife, who was actually my girlfriend at the time, and, and my mother and father-in-law. Well, we went to Cleveland in 1997 and got to go to the game. So that's obviously the, the most special memory of mine for a Major League All-Star game was just being there in person. I'm curious because I hear others, especially players, tell me how they don't particularly agree with this, but how was your feeling about the All-Star game determining who has home field advantage in the World Series? Yeah, I don't know. It's, it, that's tough. I mean, that's. Uh, I know a lot of people wanted to make it worth something. And, you know, instead of this being a show, making it an actual game where guys are playing hard and doing that. But uh, I don't know. I don't I don't think I agree with it either. Just the one game where it's an all-star game. and Because, you know, there, there's a lot of guys on a, on a 25-man roster. There's a lot of guys. And you might have one or two guys off of that team playing the all-star game and representing your team where all 25 of those other guys, you know, are a big part of the, the season and what happens throughout it. So I just I think I would like to see a, another way of determining home field, whatever that might be, as opposed to a one-game one game deal at the All Star Game uh, to determine home field home field advantage because that's obviously a big advantage for whoever wins that. Our next question is: If you could pick a league and you were the All Star Game manager, who would be on your team? That's a tough question. I think it's just. Uh, I mean, I could sit here all day and list players. Probably, um, I don't. I think it would. I don't think I could pick a league. I think it'd be pretty neat to manage either one of them. Um, so I don't think I could answer National or American League. But, uh, you know, and, and I could stand here all day and list guys I would want on my team. So um, that would obviously be neat to uh, be able to pick a league I wanted to and to manage an all-star game. But uh, I guess it's a good thing I don't have to worry about that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Clark from Wichita would like to know, Pete Rose is supposed to visit Wichita this week, and with the allegations swarming around him, what is your feeling about his appearance with the team? I'm excited to see Pete. Um, this is another tough question, uh, you know, an interesting topic of debate, whether Pete should do this, Pete should do that, Hall of Fame, obviously is a hot topic with him betting, living in Las Vegas, stuff like that. But, uh, you know, and then it comes out that he bet on games. Um, it sounds like he never bet against his team. Um, it sounds like he bet for his team some nights and obviously other games in the MLB. But, 
I don't know. I, I just believe that uh, it's like our steroid talk with stuff like that. You know, it's it's a tough topic, and I don't think any of that affected the player that he was on the field. And Pete Rose, the player, was awful fun to watch and did a lot of special things throughout his career in Major League Baseball. And I understand, you know, in, in society we got to handle ourselves a certain way and um, especially a guy in the limelight like he was and still is, you know, the standards are pretty high and uh, the expectations are pretty high. But, uh, you know, I'm a hard-nosed guy. I'm a hard-nosed – I was a hard-nosed player and Pete Rose was a hard-nosed guy and a hard-nosed player. And, you know, the stuff he does on the side, I mean, shoot, you could pull up top webs of many people, I'm sure, of things that they did off the field that aren't known by a lot of people. And it's just a tough spot. I feel for, feel for Pete and what he's going through and what he's having to deal with. And uh, Sunday will be interesting. I've never met Pete, so I'm, I'm anxious to meet him and, uh, you know, get to be around him for a little bit and uh, anxious to see how that goes Sunday night. That should be pretty cool, I would say. Uh, Bruce would like to know, is there an, ever a time where you think a player is too pumped up? Is there such a thing as yeah. being too pumped yeah, up? Yeah, I would say yes. Um, if I had a nickel for every time I said slow down during a season, I'd be a rich man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we uh, it's tough, especially younger guys. They're excited. And... They're excited to be out on that field, and they're excited to do something special for you. Want to help the team any way they can, and but sometimes that energy, and I have a talk with our younger guys a lot. Is we have to channel that energy and anxiety and excitement. You have to channel it um, because when the game gets too fast, you have to slow it down. And that's those guys you see on TV every day. That's why they're there is because they're able to slow the game down day in and day out because it does get fast. And every level you continue to, to climb the ladder at, it gets faster and faster. And you really got to slow it down. And I do believe there's times where guys are too pumped up and, you know, the adrenaline's going and, you know, you just got to sometimes just step back and take a deep breath and, and slow things down. But, yeah, to answer Bruce's question, absolutely. I think that they're – is such a thing as players being too pumped up and you just got to control it and channel that anxiety and excitement because and i love it don't get me wrong i love every bit of a guy being excited to be out there on a ball field giving everything he's got to help you win a game i mean that's special and i want 22 guys that are like that but we've got to do it under control as well helen from wichita would like to know if you think girls softball mm -hmm. should be an olympic sport absolutely that's a uh, obviously a soft spot for me, having two two daughters who do play softball. So I'm a huge softball fan, and I will continue to be a huge softball fan. I, I work with a lot of softball girls here around town. So, yes, I definitely believe that it, that it should be an Olympic sport. That's, you know, they don't have the luxury to have, like, a Major League Baseball in softball. And for them to have that opportunity to select few to uh, represent their country in the Olympics, I absolutely believe it should be. An Olympic sport. I know that America is pushing to get that back in for 2020, I believe it is. So mm -hmm. hopefully that'll work. I believe so. Mm -hmm. George from New York City would like to know the Israeli team needs a much better baseball coach to prepare for the World Base Baseball Classic, he tells us. And he <laughs> wants to tell us Kevin Hooper can be Jewish for a few years. Uh, <laughs> well, George, I appreciate the trust, I guess, in me and uh, the support of me. And, yeah, how fun would that be to be able to manage in the World Baseball Classic? But uh, I'm pretty sure the rules would not allow that. But, uh, you know, that would uh, that would be interesting and, and a lot of fun for sure. And, once again, thank you, George, from New York City for that question and having the trust and thinking I could lead that squad. That means a lot. Excellent. Todd from Springfield, that's our last question, uh, points out that the space probe is about to pass by Pluto on Tuesday. So planet, yes or no? Is Pluto a planet there, Kevin? I, I say yes, Pluto is a planet. I know in what, it's been what, about 10 years or so where yeah. I guess they said that it was no longer a planet? A planetoid, um, yeah. 
Yeah, right. But they call it now. I, I don't. A lot of people call it a dwarf planet or something. I think um, so. Yeah. I mean, it. Uh, so there you go. Still a planet in my mind, even whether it's a dwarf planet or not. But uh, tough question. I know it's kind of whoever you ask of who they of whether they think Pluto's a, a planet or not. But I'm going to go with yes on that one. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much this week, Kevin. We appreciate your time. Rob, thanks as always. All right. See you next week. We want to thank manager Kevin Hooper for joining us on Short Hops this week. We look forward to seeing you next week. I'm Rob Panier, the managing editor of the Minor League Sports Report, and we look forward to seeing you next week on Short